Lord, we thank you for every opportunity we have together with your people to consider your truth, to consider the gospel and implications of it. We thank you for the teaching that we've received these last few days. We thank you for the fellowship. We pray now that by your spirit you would give us an understanding of you and your word that will aid us in being those that you desire us to be as we go from here. Use this time, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we'd like to start off uh, with a question for Michael, and that would just be to tell us more about Christ Bible Seminary in about two minutes. About two minutes, all right. Well, uh, a, a general pattern that we have, especially in Japan, but also all around the world, is that churches are the way that they are because the pastors are the way they are. Pastors are the way they are because they've been trained to be that way in seminary. And for good or bad in Japan, um, that is the pattern. And there is a tremendous need to counteract and to push against uh, great, great legalism in the church, um, great, great um, love, greater love for traditionalism and traditions than the gospel itself and people and God. And uh, our seminary exists to buck those trends, to return grace to the classroom, to return grace to the lives of pastors, and to return grace to the Church of Jesus Christ in Japan, and to plant churches like that. And uh, it's, it's slow. It takes time. And uh, it takes a generation, or two generations, or three generations, but we're in it for the long haul. And we've been blessed by the students that the Lord has uh, brought uh, to our door. We feel it a privilege and a stewardship uh, to love them well and to model in our relationships, in our prayers together, in how we love their families, in how we um, train them and, and disciple them to, uh, to do all um, in grace and in the gospel. And um, I love them, and I'm happy to have one of our students here from Japan, Kent. Go ahead. So do you teach Old Testament there? Yes, we do. Or no, no, do you personally? I do not. I do not. Um, to tell you... I was wondering if you teaching everything. I actually try to teach as little as possible um, because, um, because we're trying to... Um, you know, get 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 the this this huge you know ship out of the harbor, and uh, I think my gifts uh, perhaps lie more in the leadership areas and in the vision casting and in the training of these wonderful men and leaders who the Lord has given to me, both in our team, our faculty, our staff, and students, um, than always in the classroom. But I teach um, mainly the areas where I will teach is uh, church history. And I'll teach some theology, and I also teach a foundational course that every student of ours takes called Personal Holiness, where we talk about um, Puritans and suffering and uh, prayer fasting. Excellent. Good. Mark, a question for you. Please define the gospel in 60 seconds or less. Uh, there is one God. He made us. He made us in His image. He made us good. We've sinned against Him, but we've fallen. God would be just and good to judge us eternally, but in His amazing love, the eternal Son of God has taken on flesh, been incarnate. Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, lived the life we should have lived, lived perfectly, died on the cross in the place of the sins, in the place of everyone who will repent of their sins and trust in Him. And God raised Him from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He will return in the same manner, and He calls us to repent of our sins and trust on Him. And He will give us new life. He will fill us with the Holy Spirit, give us the new birth, and adopt us as His reconciled children forever. Amen. Amen. I want to go right down the panel. I want to go right down the panel here, starting with John. And the question came in, what do the other panelists, what do the other speakers think about Mark's admonition that we preach the gospel in every sermon that we preach? John. I don't say that in every sermon. Um, 
but rising increasingly in my own understanding of how the gospel relates to everything is the desire to make everything pervasively gospel-oriented. So I'm, I'm fudging. Um, I don't yet feel obliged as a steady-state pastor who speaks week in and week out to say it, all those pieces, every Sunday. I want to point to Christ every message and I want there to be enough of it in the hymns and in the service so that everybody knows I'm moving towards Jesus, I'm moving towards the cross as the foundation and the solution for everything. But I, I, don't, I don't operate as I write a sermon. I have to get that whole piece into every, every message or into every Bible study I lead or into every page of every book. Uh, it's just not that clear for me. So th that that is obligatory. So that's how, what I feel and what I think about it. Yeah, yeah I, I think we. I, I would land at, at the same spot where it's good, it's going to be Christocentric. It's going to mention the cross and it's going to contrast what I'm saying um, from from what religion is and what the gospel is. And so I think that's the that's the piece I'm looking for. How do I distinguish, particularly in in my context? How do I distinguish this from um, what, what Christian Smith called uh, Christian moralistic therapeutic deism and the gospel? Like, how do I distinguish this message knowing that the bulk of my hearers are going to hear it through this lens? Um, and so I, I think that's yes, but certain pieces of it and always to try to distinguish between religion and the gospel. I think for us in Japan, we have, um, and for us in terms of our, our church planting efforts through All Nations Fellowship, uh, we, have, um, we have expectation and, and hope and anticipation um, and actualization of non-Christians coming every week. Mm -hmm. And almost non-Christians, new non-Christians coming every week. Uh, so in that sense, I think we certainly have it as an aim and as something that's in the forefront of our minds, our prayers, our, our development, to have the gospel preached every single week. Um, and of course, for the, the Christians who are there, uh, we feel strongly as well that it's, it's the gospel message that is needed, not merely at the point of, of conversion and for our salvation, but throughout the continued sanctification of our lives. So I would say we have it as a, a, a goal, a hope, and we aim towards that in our, in our ministry. Very good. Let's follow up on that. And, and this was directed to, to you, Matt. Uh, talk a little bit about the believer's need to hear the gospel. One person phrased it this way. Are Sunday mornings mainly for believers or for unbelievers? Another person phrased it this way. Is the message proclaimed to the unregenerate sheep the same as the message proclaimed to the regenerate sheep? I think it is. I, I think you see it in Romans 1 where you, you, you see Paul saying, I, I eagerly desire to preach the gospel to you. Well, he's talking to the church. The letters to the church, to, to barbarian, to Greek, I want to preach the gospel to you. And so I think a, a major piece of progressive sanctification is understanding the atonement, understanding that I, in this moment, am, am a wicked sinner redeemed by the blood of Christ and to understand both of those now today that I'm not just, Oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm all just redeemed. redeemed. Yes. Yes, I am. But I'm still a wicked sinner in need of the mercy of Christ in need of the blood of Christ in need of the cross of Christ that I, I teach it this way. There's never a point where we lean against the cross of Christ. There's just never that point. We lean against it and we go, oh, you guys, you guys should come. It, it's a constant bowing before it and saying there's room. There's room. And, and so I, I think, I don't know how to answer is the gospel presentation on a Sunday morning for those who are regenerate or those who are unregenerate. I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. It, it is. The gospel message is for those who are perishing and those who are saved. Amen. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? Mark? Well, in my sermons, I mean, sometimes it sounds like that little 60-second thing I just did. 
Um, but often there'll be parts of it in different places as I'm just engaging with the Christians and the non-Christians. So I have an application grid, and I'll sometimes say with point two, make sure we talk about man here, sinfulness. And point four, then include the rest of the story or something. So, and, and I think when you expand the treatment of the gospel like that, yeah, that's what we, we Christians rejoice in. I mean, that's what gives us hope. That's why the Lord has weekly meetings for us. The beginning of every week, we begin by reminding ourselves, we meet on Sunday morning, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. On Sunday morning, we begin by tithing our time. We begin by reminding ourselves of our identity by washing ourselves in the gospel. So yes, the Christians very much need to hear the gospel. I want to hear that more than anything else when I am assembling with Christians the first thing in the week. Amen. Amen. Very helpful. John, question for you, and let's go ahead and just, I guess, get this one out of the way. This came up several times, phrased many different ways, and the question kind of goes like this. In Packer's Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, he defines antinomy as, quote, an appearance of contradiction between conclusions which seem equally logical, reasonable, or necessary. Is the relationship between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, quote, inexplicable to our finite minds? How is it that we are calling people to repent of their sin and yet it is God who must grant them repentance. Well, the last part is not inexplicable to me. Um, the more theoretical piece about human accountability in view of divine sovereignty, maybe. So let me just say a comment about those. To me, when Jesus stands in front of the tomb of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come forth to a dead man, and he comes, that's not inexplicable because his word created the life. Command what thou wilt and grant what thou commandest. This is not inexplicable. This is explicable. You're talking to dead people. They need to live. You are to call them. Live! And when the Holy Spirit is at work in your life and you command the dead to live, they live. That's not inexplicable. It's just miraculous. So I, my, my issue there is not, like I'm, whoa, this is a fog, like a great mystery hangs over why you would call dead people to do things. You call dead people to do things because the word of God is powerful and creates life. Now, the first way you ask the question, is it uh, an antinomy or a contradiction or humanly inexplicable how God can be absolutely sovereign over all human decisions and those decisions still be responsible, accountable decisions. I think that is uh, the one for me anyway for which I don't have an, an ultimate answer. Because it really boils down to uh, how did the first sin happen? which is for me the hardest question of all. I don't know how the first sin happened. I don't know why Lucifer, created as a perfectly good being, would sin. And to put the name free will on it, it's just a name. It doesn't provide any explanatory power. It, it doesn't work for me. So I, I have no, no final explanation. So at that, at that level, the antinomy that Packer talks about between humans being held accountable for their actions, which they absolutely in the Bible clearly are, and God being ultimately, decisively in control of all of those decisions. Those are two truths in the Bible. I would die for either one of them. I don't solve that problem with free will. It works. It doesn't provide any explanatory help to me at all, nor do I find it taught in the Bible. Uh, I'm willing to just live with that mystery and say, let's make sure we lift him up as really sovereign, really totally in control. Let's make sure we call people to account to do what they're called upon to do. And let's live with all the biblical teaching in the middle that we're dead in our trespasses and sins and the natural man cannot please God and therefore speak to the dead with divine authority that they must live and believe and obey or perish. Okay. 
Mark, question for you. Uh, talk a little bit about the great problem, as Stott calls it, of the invisibility of God. How the outworking of faith through the local church in the world seems to be Jesus' most basic evangelism plan. A couple related questions to that uh, came in. Is Matthew 28 given to the church or individuals? The, the lack of New Testament admonition and rebuke for not doing personal evangelism? Elaborate on that. I don't know that I have much more to say on that than I said in whichever talk I addressed that in. I mean, First Peter 3, uh, the, the disciples evangelizing when they scatter all who went preached. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see that that's limited after the persecution in Jerusalem just to the apostles. So I think that the church as a whole, just speaking sort of systematically theology, theologically over scripture, the church as a whole is clearly acting as a witness, and that's what I tried to put together last night biblically and then giving practical examples. Uh, you know, as far as who the Great Commission was given to, uh, it's given obviously in an immediate sense to the disciples, the apostles. But then when you look and you see how that's applied in the book of Acts, the Christians beyond the apostles clearly understood it as something that they themselves would have continued to fulfill, and thus Christianity continued to grow. And then when Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, that we're to be ready to give the reason for the hope that we have uh, to anyone who asks us. That may sound a little bit more passive, but that still shows that absolutely every Christian has that kind of responsibility. So, and then you can get to further out things, which I did actually, Luke 6, about the overflow of our hearts uh, being what shaped our, our mouths. So I think, I think it may be a, a more implicit command than we sometimes present it as, even if you take the Great Commission out of it. But I think there's no way around saying that every Christian has the obligation to, and the opportunity and the responsibility and the privilege to share the good news of what God has done in Christ. We'll do it differently according to the Lord, how the Lord has gifted us and what responsibilities he hands to us in our lives. So a pastor is going to have one kind of responsibility, you know, others, others. But there's no way that I think biblically we can responsibly say that all Christians aren't obliged to participate in that. Let me ask a follow-up question then. Is there ever a sense in where because of my lack of personal evangelism that someone's blood is on my hands? Um, we think of the text that talks about the watchman on the wall who was not a good watchman. Uh, I think the answer to that has to be yes. But because Christ has borne all of our sins, I don't know how that plays out in eternity. Mm -hmm. I got nothing else on that. All right. John? Because of Christ's blood, we don't know how it plays out. I don't understand that sense. Well, it's clear in the New Testament <laughs> there are rewards talked about. Right. But all of our status, we're there because of God's grace in Christ. So when, when I'm told in Hebrews 13 that I'm accountable mm -hmm. for the members of my congregation as an elder, I believe that. I believe it fervently. I'm not entirely sure what it means, but I believe it. Uh, you know, James 3.1 tells us that teachers should, will be held accountable to a stricter judgment. Wow, I believe that. I don't know exactly kind of what that looks like on the fourth Thursday in heaven, you know, when I'm there. But boy, I believe it. And it has a weight in my soul. So on, on the, you know, the, the question of, of the blood on our hands, you know, I look at the watchman passage in Ezekiel and I think, yeah, pastors are in analogous positions and a secondary analogy then I think would be Christians who know the gospel, sharing it or not sharing it with others. But then on the other hand, we Christians sin and we have a Savior. and He has reconciled us to God by forgiving us for our sins, taking the punishment for our sins. So I know that my status before God is as a, a fully loved and adopted son, reconciled to God completely. Uh, so then what it means that there are rewards and maybe stricter judgment and have, I don't understand. I think maybe I, believe a, it. I think at, maybe at root there, and I want to go to this, is this issue of motivation for doing evangelism. What I think underlies that question is this sense of fear. I'm afraid or maybe love for the lost or uh, disobedience to God. Missions happens because worship doesn't. There's a motivational element. Let's just talk and jump in as you want to. You hit on it in, I think, your, your first talk. 
Um, just let's just go over motivations, maybe a triage of motivations for doing personal evangelism. Well, I suggested simply obedience, love for the lost, and love for the Lord. You really suggested more as you went on, right? Especially the way you ended, yeah. namely that there is a lot of joy in heaven, yeah. and if it's joy in heaven, we surely wouldn't want to be out of sync with the angels, would we? And so we should be happy. And if we're happy when people get saved, then we'd sure want to maximize that happiness. And, and there are a few things. I mean, I pray for myself, for my children, and my church that they would not miss out on the joy of leading someone to Christ. And my guess is that most of the brothers in this room have probably not personally walked anybody into the kingdom in a long time. I haven't for some time. I, people get saved as I preach. They tell me about it months later. That's, that's a little different. It's rewarding. It's, it's gratifying. But to, to walk somebody like you've described, there is a sweetness to that personal arm-in-arm -arm movement from darkness to light that very many pastors don't experience for long stretches of time. And it is sweet. It's just powerful. My, my, my daddy, who was an evangelist, when I asked him a question a year before he died, uh, what's, what's the key to joy in the church? Un, unhesitatingly, soul winning. It's because he knew what had made him tick for 50 years and why he was the most amazingly happy man I've known. He was constantly experiencing saving grace flowing through his life into the life of others and miracles were happening in other people's so joy, you, you hit it at the end. And it, 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 when we went home after your first talk, we kind of leaned over to each other and said, number four, he's going to get to number four, isn't he? Like joy. <laughs> well, there that was. Yeah, Scott, what else do we have? All right. Well, that was, that was somewhat of the motivation question. Let's go to the methods question. No, 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 we're, no. Not, we're not done with motivation here. Come on, come on. We, More? I, I, don't, I think the only one that... I, but I think it falls in, I think they're broad categories. So I think you can go subcategories now, but I think they're, the four are covered. So we can start breaking it down into subcategories here and go, okay, I want to be the leader that God's called me to be for the church, to model for the church he asked me to lead that we should do. But that now we're under obedience. Now we're under, So I, I think what we have left now that these kind of broad strokes have been painted is subcategories. I guess we can do that. Um, but I think the things in my mind are filed under uh, obedience. They're filed under joy. They're filed under th these kind of larger headings, these larger um, uh, fruits. Hmm. Okay. I mean, on the desire to glorify God, uh, I, I really do think that it's amazing that this is a way we can bring God glory now that we can't in heaven. Hmm. So that does add a special sort of, you know, zip in the step to make sure you're taking up these valuable opportunities when you're given them hmm. because we won't have those eternally. And, and we don't, we, we need to say love here. Um, and where I get the most convicted is when I measure the emotional level of desire I have for my children to be saved compared to my neighbors. And I said, whoa, why is that? And for whatever reason, I'm so knit together. I'm just so one that the thought of them being lost is sometimes almost unbearable. And then I ask, why, why not for, for Bob and David next door? Why, why, why not? And, and so I, I, I just, I pray that what, when I say I want to pursue my joy, it's really my joy in their joy. And the absence of longing for their joy is a deeply convicting thing. And I think all of us pastors should just be on our face that Jesus' teaching about the 99 and the 1, this is a very sobering parable. you got these 99 folks here. We're so happy about them. And, and there goes one off, one of those First Timothy 4, 1 people who quit believing or were never believing and they're gone. And how, how do we feel about that? that sheep and just measure that by the closest people you have that you really care about 
and, and whether it's something similar and then ask God to change my heart. Love, that love peace is uh, one I'm just always anxious to grow in. Amen. Well, let's go to the, the many questions that came in on methods, methodology, that type of thing. So let me set it up this way. And I think I'd like to pair the answer here with Mark and with Michael. And then I've got another pair of questions for Matt and for John. What's the place, uh, Mark, of methodology and programs for evangelism? For example, way of the master, evangelism explosion, door-to-door evangelism, niche evangelism, bikers for Jesus, hunters for Jesus, that type of thing. Does God, is it somewhat of a, God can use any method and he chooses to use some more than others? Are there methods that should be off limits because they alter the nature or character of the gospel message? Talk to us about methodology a little bit. Well, I think I answer all the questions you asked, yes. That's great. So, so elaborate on uh, that. <laughs> certainly there are different methodologies. Certainly any of those that contain the gospel we can use. Certainly some are better than others. Um, certainly there are some we should not use because they distort the message. Um, so I, I think uh, things like some of the programs you mentioned. Well, so for example, well, no, don't do that. Um, I think some of I think some of the I think some of the programs that you mentioned uh, I will happily use and would use them as tools. So I don't care that our congregation all knows one tool to use. I actually prefer them knowing and using different tools. Um, I would rather equip in several different ways so people see that the tool isn't the point; it's the message that you're communicating. Um, but then I, I think that if we can equip them well with those, then the opportunities are just laying out there all over the place in their lives or in especially organized events. So while I think the homogeneous unit principle is absolutely terrible for a church and really cuts across scripture, that, this idea that everyone in church should be a part of the same demographic group because that's most naturally attractive to non-Christians of that same demographic group. I think in terms of evangelism, that's fine. In terms of, if you want to have a Bikers for Jesus thing, super. It's not your church. But if you're trying to reach people that way, or people born on Thursdays, that's fine. I mean, whatever works. You know, in terms of getting people together, getting a non-Christian to identify with you on on a non-sinful basis. You know, you don't want to join together in your vices, liars, you know, whatever. But, you know, any way that we can tell the gospel to people. Why not for evangelism? All right, for evangelism, John's willing to lie. But I mean, no, 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 no. You gather all the liars together. That'd be a good group to talk to. Well, we're here. I mean, you know, I, I, lo- I loved your rose story. That was so good. You know, I want Jesus died for that rose. Oh, that was great. Anyway, so that's good. Yeah, I think we want to use. Did you just call me a liar? Well, sort of. Okay. What? But uh, no differently than you called me one in the sure. talk. <laughs> sure. Excellent. So I think we want to use those natural uh, affinities the Lord has given us, but that's not the mature church. That's a way we have to make friends with a non-Christian and let them know about Jesus. Okay. Michael, would you talk a little bit about methodology in your ministry context in Japan? Japan is um, it's tough. It's a tough field. It's a tough place. Hmm. You name the methodology, it has failed in Japan. Mm. 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 So I think the clearest message to that is that methodology is not the answer. Mm. Uh, it's not the answer. It's the substance behind the methodology. It's the substance of what, what is that methodology delivering? And like Mark said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a yes on, on most methodologies. Um, there's no one size that fits all. Our ministry is targeting young people, the younger generation, which is an unreached people group within an unreached people group in Japan. And our methodology um, is nothing unique. It would be seen as just very common in many places around the world, but it's the substance, I think, that we are hoping to focus well and present well and be well in the ministry, and we're we're finding that the substance is really what is delivering. So um, I I won't waste our time, I think, even talking about the various methodologies. All right. A pair of questions now for Matt and John along those lines. 
Matt, the question for you now, um, what is the connection between a gospel that is in fact relevant for all people at all times and the need to contextualize that gospel message for a specific people you're trying to reach? There'll be a follow-up question for John related to Whitfield in that regard, but the, talk about your context. You said the gospel's relevant. It is. What does it mean then to break that down for your people? Well, my context is um, Dallas, Fort Worth area, uh, highly churched, um, large churches. Uh, you can see some of the churches in Dallas from here. <laughs> it, I mean, $150 million, $200 million, in one church in town just started $250 million. Tell the people on the video where we are. We're in Minnesota, so... <laughs> You, you really can. Yeah, you look south. Um, so so my, the context that I find my life playing out in is, is one in which the bulk of people, not all people, but the bulk of people have some understanding of who Jesus is. So um, I use the phrase inoculated. Um, it's been my experience that the bulk of people have enough of Jesus to feel like they don't need him or that they understand him enough so they turn you off easy. So what, what I want, here's how I contextualize, just to be honest with you. I will constantly contrast the difference between the gospel and religion. Constantly. If you listen to me on podcast, if you listen, I constantly want to go, this is the gospel, this is not the gospel. This is not the teaching of Christ. This is morality, this is religion, this is methodology is religious this methodology is gospel driven this and so how i contextualize the gospel in my setting is to constantly contrast it with i, I don't want to call it evangelicalism but that, that tends to be what i call it um i, I want to in, in my setting say this is probably what you grew up with this is why it's not true because of what Jesus just said here. And so that's how I'm contextualizing the gospel. Whereas, like, I look at other dear friends of mine, like Driscoll and I have an ongoing argument of who has the harder job. Him trying to proclaim the gospel in a completely secular society or me trying to proclaim the gospel in a society where everyone feels like they already know the gospel despite the fact that they don't know the gospel. Uh, and I've had some most gut-wrenching experiences of... Um, in, in another church, being a part of their baptism service, just saying, hey, would you help us baptize? We're baptizing a lot. And being in the water with a girl that says, I want to be baptized. My mom's sick. And me having to go, well, okay, this is about to get really awkward because I'm, I'm out of the water. I'm not baptizing. All right. So, I, yeah, I'm getting baptized. I love, I love Jesus. My mom's sick. I, I need to be baptized because my mom's sick. Okay, okay, this is a problem. I mean, this is a problem. So th that's what contextualization looks like for me. I need to contrast religion with the gospel. It, and, it, and at times I need to contrast secular thought with the gospel. But, but the bulk of the people out in the crowd for us are de-churched, which means they grew up in church and they started seeing some of the weird hypocrisy in it or how it didn't add up or how it didn't make sense or how it didn't, and they walked away. And now for whatever reason, they're, they're coming back or friends are drawing them in. But even those friends have church experience. It, even people who've never professed Christ have, have had some church experience. Um, and so we, we get our, I tell you when I, I smile, I smile when just the absolute, last time we baptized, we, we had a guy that got in the water and was just grew up an atheist his whole life. And I was like, thank you, Jesus, for that. That was just a little gift for me. It really, I, I felt like that had my name on it for Matt Chandler from, from Christ, you know, here there sleep well. And, um, and a witch. And I mean, I was, I was beaming. I, I mean, I had music up on the way home, like, pagans, yes, all right, <laughs> versus just get in the water. Hey, I grew up in church my whole life, you know, I thought this is what it was, this isn't what it is, this is what I come professing Christ as my Lord and Savior for the first time, despite the fact that I had every one of Michael Libby Smith's albums. <laughs> so that, that's, that's how I contextualize it. Okay, excellent. So, John, uh, working with context a little bit and a little bit back to methodology, trying to pull these together in a Whitfield question. Uh, was it just a different day and age in which issues of contextualization, preaching in the UK, preaching in America, 
you just preached, if you were an itinerant evangelist like that, if you were in that type of ministry, that's one question. Related to it, though, would be the fact that it seems that Whitfield kind of pioneered the use of newspapers in his day, promoting his meetings, promoting his schedule. Can you comment on how churches or pastors should use advertising and means of technology to promote their ministries, promote their church? What is The question was, what does BBC do in that regard to reach the community? Yeah, the, uh, the, where I ended on the paradoxes, the conundrums, the riddles, the uh, contradictions of the good and evil uh, is something I've learned in large measure um, besides from life by reading Mark Knoll in his, in his historical work because uh, Mark is a, a believer, he's an evangelical and, he, and he's probably the most foremost um, historical, church historical scholar in America today and uh, that's his conclusion of every book that it's ambiguous. So in regard to this issue Whitfield uh, is responsible for most of the problems in the world today. Um, he's responsible for the emergent church, and he's responsible for seeker sensitive, and he's responsible for TV evangelism, and he's responsible for the weird use of, of everything because he, he broke through in, in the modern era, just kind of on the, on the way out of, of the old world to the new world. He, he broke through and, be, and became the first actor, preacher, entertainment preacher, uh, media savvy preacher because of newspapers and letters and publication of journal. And I mean, if you read Stout, uh, Stout says all these things, only says them cynically. And it would, it would, I would rather read Noel writing that biography. He would say them and, and be sober about them. He wouldn't have a snide attitude about it. Uh, but if you can navigate your way through the cynicism and the snideness, there is truth there. And so yes to Whitfield's um, alertness to uh, sending somebody ahead to make sure they know he's coming. <laughs> and putting things in newspapers and publishing journals and using uh, the latest uh, transportation like horses and buggies and ships to get to where he needs to be and uh, forging an international coalition from Scotland to England to New England so that this thing has some staying power. And we usually think of Whitfield as the one who had all the organizational savvy, but Whitfield was operating, I mean, uh, Wesley was operating, did I say Whitfield? We usually think of Wesley as having all the savvy because he organized all these small groups and became the head of a denomination in Whitfield said, I could put my name on anything, but he did the organiz organizing as he moved around among pastors and, and leaders. And I think uh, all of that is, was right for him to do. I mean, he broke out of the churches. He, that was, he, it was inflammatory that he preached in public and not in, in churches. And it, it seemed to undermine. And it gave rise to modern parachurch evangelicalism, which is a problem and, and a gift. Everything is ambiguous. Everything. Everything you look at as good is also bad, except the Bible and Jesus. <laughs> everything. And so, no, no, everything should be corrected. Matt Chandler's way of doing it should be corrected. My way, your way, every, everybody needs correction. And, and we're just, we're constantly navigating our way through ambiguities in life. And so I want to say yes to, to, what, to what he did. As far as what worked then, you couldn't do what he did today, I don't think, if you went downtown here and put up your little stage and started preaching. Everybody would call you wacko and, and 20 people would gather around and make fun of you. And God was at work in the 18th century. God came down. He came down on Wesley, he came down on Whitfield, on Edwards, on the Tenants, on the Erskines, and these guys had a movement that God did. You can't make that happen. And then when it, when it starts to happen, you just try to humble yourself and be obedient to it. And then, of course, he had all these phenomenal gifts. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, God blessed 
and, and he's, he's doing it today. I mean, this, this is a, this is a, a phenomenon, and, and doing that seminary is strange and weird, and, and Mark's kind of four-square church way of doing it there and is just phenomenal. I mean, God's, that's... We're going to use that as a nine-mark promo. Thank you, John. Um, just an unbelievable... I mean, you, isn't it incredible? I, mean, I, don't know, I don't really know what your question is asking. I'm just telling me when to stop. I, the, 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 the reform thing, you got Seattle, you got Denton, Highland Village, you got R.C. Sproul, you got Alistair Begg, you got Cap, Capitol Hill, you've got um, Sovereign Grace Ministries. I remember when I first met Mark Driscoll, I said, you know, this kind of looks a lot like a little hipper Sovereign Grace. He said, who? He never even heard of C.J. Mahaney and Sovereign Grace. So, so these, these two in, interesting reformed charismatic deal over here and this kind of reformed hip Seattle thing over here. And what is that What in the world? So I, nobody's organizing this. Nobody's managing this. There's just a lot of unusual Whitfieldian uh, release of energy and relevant ways of talking today that I just kind of stand back and say, hmm. hmm. I asked CJ one time, and then I'll stop, I promise. I asked CJ one time, CJ Mahaney, I said, so I described about 15 of these streams that I see. And I said, so uh, do you think that anybody should try to make that into a river? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. We should. And I think that's kind of like what, you know, Together for the Gospel is. And I said, well, I'm not, I don't have that gift, and so if you want to try that, you can. But I'm just watching and enjoying and doing my little Bethlehem Baptist uh, effort here. So I, I doubt that that will, will ever happen or should happen, that you try to find out all the outcroppings of the movement of God's renewing spirit in our day and get them all together in a room and make it a, a thing. I, I just, God is doing it, and we probably mess it up. If everybody should just love each other and just do real well what you do, that's my sense. Amen. 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 All right, in the time that remains, we've got, uh, we've got two more big sets of questions to talk about, and then a few smaller ones if we can, if we can get through them. So a lot of questions on this particular topic. Mark, you wrote in your book, um, the gospel and personal evangelism. You wrote, a gospel that does not offend has not been understood. Now, this is for the whole panel, but why don't you take it first, Mark? How should that be understood? A gospel that does not offend has not been understood. How should we understand that statement with respect to two types of evangelism? Confrontational evangelism, the person next to you on the plane, door-to-door -door work, that type of thing, versus the more long-term relational evangelism, a family member that you're wooing over a long period of time, a neighbor, that type of thing. What does it mean to be salty? Is there a right or wrong way to provoke unbelievers? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think we tend to think that the door-to-door, -door, uh, cold turkey evangelism is by nature offensive, and the long-term relational evangelism is not offensive. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, at all. It's the message, not our method, the message that needs to be offensive. So some, you know, let's say if, if I'm not a believer and Michael's a believer, but we're friends, we've gone to school together, so we've gotten to know each other, Michael's sharing the gospel with me. I want to be offended, not at Michael per se, though it might bother me that he thinks this, but what should really offend me is when I understand what he's telling me about God and my sin. That, now that's what needs to be offensive. And, and that's where I think we can learn something very positive from Whitfield. In, in the sermons of his that I've read, he never tries to dress up the gospel and make it immediately sugar sweet in a way it shouldn't be. Some of the programs you mentioned a few minutes ago, when you mentioned various ones, will say things, would you like, like, would you like this free gift of eternal life? Well, I just think that's a bad tee up to the gospel. I mean, the, the obvious, that, that's a shoe salesman in the 1950s. I mean, the obvious answer to that is, yes, I would please. When the obvious answer to Jesus to the disciples you know, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. Well, the obvious answer there is no thank you. You know, the cross wasn't a religious symbol. That's just like saying, you know, go be killed terribly, publicly, shamefully. So this good news that we have to present 
is undermined by some of the less thoughtful ways we try to appeal to the non-Christian in wanting something immediately happy. And I think that the offense that we're looking for is an offense in the realization of the gospel message itself, not in our, our method of being confrontational. Anyone else? Yeah, just I think what would help people understand that sentence, if a person hasn't been offended, they haven't understood the gospel, is to say what, what that means is nobody likes to be called a damnable sinner. If you find that person, that sentence will be false. The day that you enjoy having your sin exposed and your wickedness exposed and, and your selfishness named for what it is, the day that you start enjoying that will be the day that sentence ceases to be true. So we just make sure we need to make sure that the the word offense probably scandalizomai, uh, stumbling. I'm stu you're you're telling me something. I'm stumbling over on the way there. Not jumping on top of him and saying, thank you for putting that under my feet. We get to that point, but a person that doesn't feel, I don't like to be called a sinner. I don't like to think of God as angry at me. You're telling me that I deserve everlasting punishment. Where in the world do you find anybody that says, I like that? And so that's what has to be. I mean, I think in our experience, the people that Matt doesn't like to baptize are like that. I mean, if you've been brought up in a Christian home, you don't remember a time when you weren't, didn't love the Lord. Uh, you know, you were converted, then we conclude theologically early in life. They, they may not, you may not watch them go through that experience of being individually scandalized. So in our experience, we find that with people growing up in Christian homes. But they too themselves can't like the idea uh, that they deserve God's judgment. There was some point at which they, you know, mentally, morally bowed their knee to Christ. And so that offense is then for them in the past perhaps. Uh, but I think we, we probably run into people to whom it's not immediately offensive because the Lord's converted them early on. Hmm. Hmm. Let's run with that just one step deeper then. We want to live in such a way that Christ is seen as a treasure. Christ is seen as attractive to unbelievers. What does it mean then to, is it primarily an external thing? People will observe my peace or my marriage or the smile on my face or the, in some circles, uh, the things I do and don't do, the places I go and don't go. Is it primarily a, a disposition of the heart kind of thing or is it an external thing? And then does it cross a line at some point where you may like what God has done for me and this is all true, but there's all of this sin and repentance stuff that has to be talked about as well. Maybe, Matt, would you take that? Just you're in that suburban context, very religious group. Yeah, I, I think you want to, in, in your preaching and teaching, and, and I'll, I'll roll it back here, because what, what we're trying to do at the village is stop some of the cycle. And, and so one of the first things we wanted to address at the village was children's ministry. How are we going to teach our children? How are we going to teach them Jesus? How are we going to teach them the gospel? How are we going to... Because what we found is that the, the bulk of religious people who we were baptizing, who were coming to know Christ, had to convert... A, were offended that, that we would question. And in fact, there were people who left. Uh, I remember one man in particular that came and sat down with me and just said, I'm leaving because I don't... Like, I, I feel good before I come here and then I don't know when I leave. So I, I'm, I'm, leave, I'm going. And well, I mean, he's in a great place to go, never have that happen again. Dallas, uh, all over the place. But you, what we were finding is conversion experience that, that looked like this. Um, little Timmy, do you want to come to heaven with mommy and daddy? Or do you want to burn in hell? <laughs> what do you want to do, Timmy? Okay, let's go. Let, let's, let's go up front. And so for us, I mean, to, to combat it, we, we're going, let, let's start early. Let, let's start early. And, and so we teach doctrine to, to our children. I've got my, my little five-year-old is, I, by the way, I think she's just doing it because she doesn't want to go to bed at night. But if, when I try to put her to bed at night, on the way out of the room, she'll ask me, tell me about Jesus and the cross or tell me about the Trinity. The, like the Trinity is bothering my five-year-old, which is a great deal. It's bothering me too, right? But, um, but, but I'm going, hey, my, the, what, what Ann, what Carl... What Matt, what those guys are writing, what they're teaching our children. I've got my five-year-old asking me about the triune God. 
not, not hearing, oh, God hates liars. Don't, don't be a liar. You know, God, these are the character issues that God enjoys. And so I, I think right out of the gate, we're trying to combat that cycle by, by really addressing children's ministry, preschool ministry, in, in a profoundly doctrinal way so that here's how I've taught it out loud to our people. My daughter, uh, about the age of two, fell in love with pink. All things pink. So here's how we talk about God. How good, how beautiful, how right is God that he gave us pink? Right? So, so that, that's a different way to anything my daughter enjoys, I want to trace back the authorship to Christ. Anything my son revels, I want to trace back the authorship to Christ. Anything as the creator of all things. So w- what I'm trying to do early on is, is not point to God's disappointment in our failures, but in his deep love for us and giving us such things to communicate his love, his grace, his mercy. His, so that God, for my three-year-old daughter at the time, was the God of pink. And, and then the God of candy. And he's the God of dress-ups. And he's the God of, you know, we took our kids to China. He's the God of, we just continually want to instill the joy of, of who he is in them by very early communicating, look at what he did. Look at what he did. And, and so I know that's a roundabout response to that question, but we haven't, we haven't mentioned that part of all of this yet. Sure. And in, in regards to evangelizing what's next and instilling the joy of Christ in what's next. And, and so primarily, yes, there's front lines, but in regards to breaking the cycle and wanting it to be, wanting the joy of Christ to be, that's what I want, that's my pursuit, that's what I'm after, that's the goal, that's the, uh, we want to instill that very early on into our children and then, let, you know, in preaching and teaching, it's what we do. So um, God gives pink, God gives candy, God's the give her every good and perfect gift sure. and then where do you stir in and you don't deserve any of this and the only reason you get it is because and and how early do you want <coughs> her to receive that uh, yeah and how you get tell. sure I, I want to constantly talk, talk about two things in our home o- over everything over meal over um daddy daughter time on date night on at bedtime i want there to be two constant themes goodness grace and mercy and our wickedness and so where god gives me the chance to point out her wickedness i want to point it out and then point right back to the God of pink. And, and where, so I, I think it's the same conversation. I, I think it's got to be the same conversation. Um, but I, it was my experience, in, especially early on in, in talking that first two years with guys, that, that, that God had become a policeman. That, that was it. He, he was just the divine policeman who saw all that they were doing wrong and yeah, loved them, but saw, you know, there, there was no grandeur, glory, might, power, just, I, I've, I, I've failed in all these areas so that you got back to religion. You got back to let me try to earn his favor. Let me try to earn his favor. So in small ways, the God of pink is look at the grandeur, look at the might, look at the glory of God, and, and, and then look at you. Look at Look at how unbelievable he is to you. Look at how unbelievable he is to mommy and daddy. Look how gracious he is in that you, you know our home. You know our... And, and this is... I, one of the things I try to teach our staff, we're all young, we all have to... I mean, I apologize to my children constantly. This is daddy's wickedness. This is God still working on daddy's heart. E- even big things. Even... You know what? I think that, that there might be a little too much television in, in our house. So then let's gather up. I failed you. This is daddy's wickedness. This is daddy's need of grace. This is daddy. And so to me, it's the, it's the same message. It's the same message. The goodness and might and beauty of Christ. Our wickedness. So I think where the rubber meets the road is when you get to that point and the question arises, so I want pink and everything good and I don't deserve it. And you're telling me the solution is 
Christ and the gospel, how do I get it? And that's just, that conversation is going to happen pretty early. Sure. And how do you not bring a three, four, five-year-old to premature profession of faith? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to answer your question. I pray a lot. Yeah. I, I pray a lot. And then I tell you where I've, where I've benefited so far is that my daughter, for whatever reason, um, probably to have me on my knees much more often, is just born a skeptic. Just born a, you know, we were reading her a little book about the Trinity that gave an illustration about, uh, it was a really horrible illustration, but gave a little illustration. She, I mean, immediately found the flaw in it. She's like, that's not true. What, what? It's not true. I play by myself all the time. I play by myself happily all the time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, the author's an idiot, boo. And there are a lot of morons out there, and we're going to have to watch out for them. So uh, I think that he's protecting me right now because my daughter's a skeptic. And she's not going to, oh, daddy believes this. Let's go. Because she'll, e even now, I mean, there have been times my wife and I almost with a little panic look, look at ourselves, you know, look at each other across the dinner table because of something she shot back. Or because, hey, boo, do you want to pray? No, I don't. You. Go ahead, Daddy. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. So far, what you're saying has not been true because there's no premature decision of faith. She's still probing it for weaknesses. So, that's an advertisement for Children Desiring God Conference in <laughs> April. <laughs> there we go. Those are not easy questions. No. I've raised no. five kids mm. up into professions of faith, and mm. I can describe how we did it, but, but I don't have great confidence that we as a church have, have got that one figured out so that we don't raise up a generation of, of uh, nominal Christians. All right, Mark, one last question um, for you, and then I'm going to uh, pitch it over to John with actually a last question that I'd like you just to direct. It's, it's one that came up many times here. We'll get to it in a second. Mark, salt, light, in the world, but not of the world. Uh, savor of life unto life for some. Uh, I want Christ to be attractive. Pastor's asking about this. Again, let's really, I want to hear you go at that. I want to love my neighbor. I want to live a winsome life. And yet, there's really hard things I'm going to have to tell them at some point that, that, that may not be attractive at all. That may just, because it's leading to a question I want to ask John about fear. So just talk about, again, that in the world, but not of the world, salt, light, love, savor of life, aroma of Christ. Christ is great. He's my treasure. And this is really going to offend you. Well, usually, if we're talking about literally my neighbor, that's not going to be one conversation. There's going to be a relationship that gets built up. And the first time I have lunch with almost anybody, by nature, I just interrogate them. I ask them about their parents, their grandparents, how they met, when they became Christians, you know, if they're from a Christian home, you know, what they did when they were five, when they were 10, when they were 15. I mean, I just, so when I'm first meeting a neighbor, getting, and I say, you can ask me all the same questions, but when I'm first getting to know a, a neighbor or somebody like that, people tend to like to talk about themselves. They feel loved, and in fact, I am loving them. And they, they know that, and they sense that, and I'm genuinely interested. Well, you know, partly. So, it depends on, depends on what we get into. But I mean, I, I mean to be interested. I'm curious. And uh, so they're, they're being genuinely loved. And they, they sense that. And people are naturally going to like that. I don't think that's manipulative. I just think that's the nature, the way the Lord made us with human relationships. So that at whatever point, however long I'm carrying on this conversation, you know, at whatever point I get to, at some point... You know, the, the fact that I understand, not because of my personal evaluation of them uniquely, but I understand because of my own study of God's revelation of himself and of the truth about us, that we are all sinful, and then draw out the implications for them then personally. I think they understand that I'm not, I'm not the author of that, and I'm not shooting that at them, though they may feel it's kind of horrendous that I can actually believe that, and, you know, be led around to wander around free in the country. You know. So I was talking to a secular Jewish friend the other day, and, and it, 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 I don't think he had understood before that we'd spent a day booking a few years ago, going to used bookstores, and thought I'd covered this, but maybe he forgot. But anyway, it came up again what, what I think Christianity teaches about sinfulness, and he 
just thought it was horrible, you know. Now, I don't think that trashed our relationship. That may have made him not particularly anxious to call me again soon. I don't know. But it's, I think if you do it in the context of getting to know somebody, even if it's on an airplane trip and I'm just, I've been sincerely interested in them and their family and what's going on, then it's the message that's offensive. You know, hopefully it's, it's not, they don't have a reason to personally reject me. And this is, this is one of the places I love, John, the way you talk about being satisfied in God. Because I think people see that. I think the Lord made us to be like that. And even for people who hate the message, they like what they see in the result of somebody who is truly happy and satisfied in things that seem, that just have a sort of precognitive feel that they are innately good and, and, and right, that you can be a human being and be satisfied like that, not based on any external possession. There's something, I think, that rings true in them. You know, in, in Bunyan's Holy War, you've got the town of Mansoul, Diabolus takes over the whole thing, except the town crier, old man conscience. He's largely controlled by Diabolus. But every once in a while, he grabs the bell, and he just starts ringing the bell and running through the town of Mansoul, saying, Diabolus is a liar and a thief. Emmanuel is the true prince of Mansoul. Well, that happens when you talk to your non-Christian friends. When you're delighted in God, when you're satisfied in the Lord, there is something authentically human about the way he made us to be that will make even the most offended non-Christian see something winsome and attractive, not because we're clever or witty or dress well, but because we love the Lord. And that's how he made us to be. Amen. Amen. Well, can I yeah. just yep. a little tiny follow-up? Because um, I'm trying to figure out why, I, why I'm, I'm less successful than Mark Dever. Um, and I, I think there's something about the way I'm wired that if we get to that point about some bad news being shared about you, it kind of is over at that point. Whereas you are wired in such a way that the relationship survives. Like, I state things in such a way that it's over. I mean, it's just, they're gone. And, and... Give, give me an example of when you've done that. You're going to go to hell and, and, I mean, just, just <laughs> without... <laughs> not saying it like that. The reality of hell, the reality of your sinfulness, your depravity, you seem to be able, and it, it, there's a kind of a, an outgoing interest that, that makes these, these ultimates not feel at that moment as ultimate, and he doesn't say as they are, because that sounds bad, as, as ultimate as they seem like they should be felt to be. And, and yet that rescues the relationship for you to get them to the point where they can see them as serious as they are, whereas I think I may prematurely push them to the ultimate sense of, you're not feeling how serious this is yet, and you need to, and that, that, that makes them feel like there's, there's no future for this relationship. This preacher guy is, is just, uh, this is too heavy. Whereas you, you speak about things, and the, the heaviness factor is suspended somehow for a season, and then can come in and conversion. How does that happen? Well, you know, I, I don't know that I've really seen that many people converted. I'm glad you think I'm successful at that, but I don't know that I, I have. But I think when I have, when I look at it, you know, it's usually not been those, uh, usually, I don't think it's ever been that I'm aware of an airplane kind of conversation. It's been like with Ryan, just studying Mark's gospel for three or four months together. So Jesus is saying the offensive things. I am helping them come to understand Jesus. I'm helping them come to understand the gospel, what Christianity teaches. So it, it might not have such a personal dart as if it were in the first conversation. And, you know, Michael's just a complete secularist, and I tell him, yeah, you're going to burn. You know, it's not, it's not like that. Uh, it's, it's instead Michael is curious about Christianity. So he's reading about Jesus, and we're talking about it together. And he, it's more Socratic, and he comes to see that, wow, this is what Jesus teaches. And I go, yeah. I mean, a, per a perfect example is Bilal, this Muslim Lebanese friend I mentioned in one of the talks. In that very same conversation, he was praising me and my wife for having such a righteous home. Because he'd been in our home, and he was just contrasting it with Britain. And, um, and I, I, I thought I saw an opportunity for the gospel there, and I don't know that was quite right. But I said... So, Bilal, do you think when I die, I'm going to go to hell? 
And he said, he paused for a moment, he said, surely not. God would not send someone so righteous as you to hell. And I knew that when I asked him that question, he would ask the follow-up, which is why I asked it. And he paused for a minute and he said, and do you think when I will die, I will go to hell? I said, oh yes, Milo, you will certainly go to hell. You know, be because, because I will go to hell. All, everyone will go to hell because of our sins against God. We need to save you. So that was an example in which, you know, I did sort of push it personally like that in order, that he, but I had that relationship already. And it survived. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Relationship. Mm. <laughs> We're torn not to stop on these things. How we need the Lord's help in these things. Mm. Well, John, I want you to, to uh, encourage us even as you uh, close us in prayer. And there were several questions that came in. They weren't questions. They were confessions of men who are here. Phrases like, I am paralyzed by fear. I can preach to hundreds in my congregation about the gospel, but I cannot bring myself to open my mouth to an individual. I'm afraid that I might manipulate. I'm afraid I might say it wrong. I'm afraid of losing the relationship. I'm afraid of being rejected. I'm afraid of failure. And then several of them, just the, the, the sense of guilt over not doing that has been brought to light through this conference. What do you tell those folks, which is many of us, if we're honest, we have strong fear and hesitation in this regard. How do we rest in the gospel even as we per pursue these things for God's glory? Um, just to, to orient myself on that spectrum of fear, um, what I find most indicting about my own fear is that it rises in proportion to the sophistication of the person I'm talking to. When I do my jogging evangelism in my neighborhood, it's mainly poor and uneducated people that I'm passing as I jog, and I've got tracks in my pocket, and uh, it's Monday or it's early in the morning, and I, I'm not pressed for time, so I'm jogging, and, and I pray for the Lord to help me stop. I find that relatively easy to do. So here's three guys, Native American, African American uh, and and uh, Hispanic guys, and they're trash talking each other. It's about eight eight o'clock in the morning, and they're just laying in the bush and talking about Obama. And I thought this is cool, so I just blunder right into these guys and say, "Hey, can I tell you about Jesus?" Now I I find that incredibly easy to do because I frankly I feel superior to those guys. In that, there it is. End of Whitfield, right? End of, just, there, goes, there goes John Piper. He's down to selfish got ego. And, but if, if I run by a bus stop and there's a nicely dressed woman and, uh, and she's on her way to work downtown in the 46th floor of the IDS Tower as a lawyer, I don't stop. I'm sweating and, you know, cut off Bermuda shorts on, 63 years old, I look like an idiot. <laughs> She's so, you know, perfect. So there, there, there's my, so all that to just say I'm, I'm, I'm with you and that's, that's, that's pride, that's fear, that's ranking, uh, Acts 5.41, rejoice that we were shamed for the name. I won't mind being shamed by somebody who's a lower uh, educated person, but I don't want to be shamed by a lawyer. <sighs> Do I need the cross or what? Now, what, what do you do? I, I don't think I can say much more than has been said except that life is very short and the approval of the creator of the universe is infinitely more valuable than the approval of any sophisticated person. 
and I am not responsible for their conversion. I'm responsible, as Mark just laid it out so well, to be faithful to the gospel. And um, everything is going to work together for my good. If they roll their eyes, if they spread rumors about me, if they say ugly things, the, the sinking. See, I, I think all of us are wrestling with things that happened to us when we were four. I can name two horribly embarrassing things that I can remember from grade school that I think scarred me forever and made me very hesitant to say certain things in certain situations. So preaching, easy. Piper's bold and acid-toned, but I am no more bold than you are on the airplane, and I'm no more bold, and a lot of it is owing to different kinds of experiences we've had. And I, I just think we should look that in the face and say, blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. That is addressed squarely to our situation. They're going to revile. Reviling is the thing I don't want more than anything. Shoot me, yes. Revile me, no. Make me lose my job and I'll be cool and strong. But I don't want to be reviled falsely. So Jesus take, takes that one on and he says, great is your reward in heaven. So, brothers, do we believe in what's coming? I really think being heavenly minded is the answer here. Life is short. Heaven is long. Christ is there. His approval is there someday. Um, he is on our side. These people don't matter ultimately if they're on our side or not. He matters ultimately. That, that whole thing, do we believe it? Do, at that moment, on the plane or in the neighborhood or at the office or in the, wherever, do we believe it? And so let's pray for faith. Let's pray that he is supremely valuable to us and that we then would be granted, granted the gift of care that others join us in that supreme value. Paralyzed. I'm supposed to close in prayer? So I'm going to pray for, for those of us who, who wrestle with that and then, and then uh, I'll give back to Scott. Father, I, I, I knew this, this panel would get to the point of my own weakness, my own fears, and I just want to be really, really candid. I feel so inept compared to Mark, and Mark feels inept. And so... We're in this together. I hope these brothers feel uh, arm in arm with fellow self-contradictory people. Why would, why would John Piper preach with such boldness to 5,000 folks and then be squeamish with a well-dressed woman on the street? Well, that's that. God, break in. Break in on me. Help, help me to care more, like Mark is way ahead of me on this, care more about asking what happened when you were five and what happened when you went to high school. And people do like you to take interest in them. And I'm hurrying home. i got a book to write. So God, I pray for greater interest in my heart in other people and less fear about what they think of me, especially the sophisticated ones, and more belief in the reward of heaven. Great is your reward in heaven, and it's coming soon. Oh, give us a keen sense of what we're going to die, and when we die, we're going to see him. And that won't, everything will be made up for. Hundredfold, thousandfold, millionfold. So God, we confess our sins. You are faithful and just. You forgive our sins. 
And I really pray that the upshot of this conference would be new, fresh boldness. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So God, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and fill these brothers on their way home in Jesus' name?